shows what we can do when we, <laughs> when we record things together. <laughs> uh, no, it really shows that, yeah, what we can do, the benefits of us all working together to relocalize power, to maximize <coughs> the environmental, economic, and social benefits of the clean energy transition. Um, and it really is a movement that we can all be a part of. And through this program, um, we'll be mapping energy communities throughout Europe. We'll be providing technical support and guidance and assistance. So if anyone's not involved in a community energy group already, please do get in touch and we can really work together to, to inspire and share best practice and really get, get, get this movement going. Uh, tonight, we have a great uh, lineup. We have... Um, Achille Anousse from the uh, European Commission uh, talking about the overall program. Uh, we have Miriam Castanet, who is the repository coordinator. And then we have a panel uh, with Ruth Buggy from uh, Sustainable Energy Authority in Ireland. Uh, we were hoping to have Eckhart Wurzner, the mayor of Heidelberg, but his train has broken down. <laughs> so Claire's going to be standing in for him from Energy Cities. Uh, and then he'll be joining us later for the drink part. Uh, we have Dirk from EcoPower, who lots of us met earlier. And we have Susanna Sasiek uh, from the Polish Green Network. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Ashil. Thanks very much. So um, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here with you all and to see that so many of you have managed to be here in person as well. And of course, I'm also welcoming everyone who's tuning in from the virtual world. Um, I promise to keep this monologue rather short um, so that we can move to the drinks, but we can also move to the panel and hear from practitioners to give key insights on how energy communities can be developed but also supported at uh, multiple levels of governance. Now, first, what I will give to you is a sketch of the background to the Energy Communities Repository. What I will answer more specifically are two questions. How did it come to existence and why? As regards to how, I can tell you that it dates back from 2020 when the European Parliament asked us to the European Commission to set up an energy communities repository. And for that, they provided us 1 million euros. Now in 2021, the Commission published a call for proposals, providing consortia from over the EU, the possibility to submit their proposals on how they would manage such a repository on behalf of the Commission. In that same year, we selected the consortium that is with us today, and that consists out of Energy Cities, Rescoop, and Federine. And I want to thank them for organizing this uh, event, this kickoff event, first and foremost. Um, now, moving forward, this project will last two years, starting 2022 until 2023. Okay, sorry little experience with this uh, considering the COVID uh, situation. Um, yes, so moving forward, depending on the success and the outcome of the project, we will decide whether we will extend the project beyond 2023 or not. So that is as far as the how question goes. Now let's move to the why. The Energy Community Repository is there to monitor, support, slash, boost energy communities as they have been defined in the Clean Energy for All Europeans package, as we call them citizen and renewable energy communities. Now, such a boost, as we have already heard, is necessary for the EU to achieve its 2030 and 2050 targets to address this massive issue that is facing us as humankind, climate change. Now, energy communities can mobilize private capital investment, but also increase support for sustainable energy projects, as well as 
introduce flexibility into the energy system and energy market. And as such, they can contribute not only to a timely, but also a cost-effective energy transition. But there's more to it. Energy communities can also contribute to a just transition by allowing citizens to take control over their energy production, supply, and consumption. And this potential cannot be underestimated. Some studies indicate that Europe's citizens could be producing up to half of the EU's renewable energy by 2000, 2050. Now, in addition, energy communities provides the possibility for those affected by sustainable energy projects to also reap the associated benefits. And these benefits are numerous and various. They range from nurturing a common identity or purpose, a sense of belonging, to creating local job opportunities and keeping economic revenue and local talent within the community. Furthermore, energy communities can deliver on access to affordable energy, which is something that we are all concerned with today. And they can do this by relying on reduced profit margins for their members or relying on their own production capacity in the current high price environment. In short, there are as many benefits as there are reasons to join, set up, or support an energy community. And as such, to help reshape the energy system, and yes, even democratize the energy transition, and as such, widening consumer choice and really putting them at the heart of the energy transition. And I therefore, to conclude, recommend you all to carefully listen to our next speaker, which is Miriam Castanier. I hope I pronounce it well, a bit French maybe. Um, as she will tell you how the repository can help you set up and support an energy community. Thank you for listening and I wish you a very informative and pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Achille, and thanks also to Anna for having set the scene and given us some background on why the repository came into being. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what the repository is actually going to do. Um, so first thing I want to check maybe with the audience online, can you see the presentation? Is somebody saying something? Not yet? Should be visible now? Yeah, great. Okay, good. Then we can start. Actually, quite interesting. I've never done a hybrid event, so it's interesting to see how you cater for two audiences. Um, so, um, how will the Energy Communities Repository support energy communities in practice? There's a few different things that we're going to do, one of them being data collection and analysis. I'll explain a little bit more about uh, why and how we're going to do this. Uh, technical assistance and uh, best practices and a toolbox to really help communities have everything that they need to keep moving along their path. And uh, last but not least, website and communications, which obviously is very important if we want to stay in touch and share our results and findings with each other. So to go into a bit more detail for the data collection and analysis, one of the things we're going to do is to map energy communities in the EU. So uh, for those here and for those listening online, we might get in touch uh, over the coming weeks and months to maybe uh, get some information, ask for your help to reach out to energy communities so that we can really get a good idea of where energy communities are at nowadays in the EU and maybe what next steps are needed in order to help them move forward. Another thing we're going to do is assess the impacts of energy communities to date. And the idea behind this is really to have a tool that forms a solid basis for decision makers to then develop the enabling frameworks for energy communities to help them on their path and in their activities. And we're also going to do a policy analysis, tracking the transposition process, analyzing the, the policies that are being developed to identify best practices, but to also see what trends are developing among governments and also maybe identify gaps that are currently still existing. 
maybe the most practical part of what we're going to do, technical assistance, and that's probably also most interesting to the energy communities themselves. Um, we're going to aim to offer technical assistance to at least 150 communities in different shapes and forms. So 25 communities will receive direct technical assistance, so that can be things like feasibility studies or so on. Um, around 50 communities will receive support through online twinnings, by peer learning and getting in touch with, with other people who have maybe already done what they want to do now. 80 communities will, uh, we're going to target through national capacity building webinars. Maybe one thing that's really uh, important to uh, flag here is that we're not just going to work on this by ourselves, uh, but we have a whole network of national experts from all across the EU that are going to support the communities directly in their country, from their context and in their own language. That was really important to us. And a specific focus is going to be put on countries in Eastern Europe where there's been less developments in the field of energy communities to date and there is more support needed and we're actually really happy to have one of the national experts with us today actually also in the room another one and another one on the panel um, with us today from Poland so you'll hear from her later on um, and then we'll also organize EU wise capacity EU wide capacity building webinars um, to promote specific good practices and maybe things that we hear that are really needed in the field and that lots of people are interested in and to be able to share information on this one thing worth pointing out is the Energy Communities Repository does not offer financial support. So that's a question we've actually started receiving. The support that we're offering is in expertise. Maybe in the future there might be something, we don't know, but uh, for now this is the, this is the target that, uh, this is the support that we're offering. In terms of best practices, I already mentioned that in the field of policy, but we're also going to look at best practices from energy communities so that any community that goes to the repository's website and says, okay, I want to do, I don't know, we want to put some solar panels on our roof. We don't really know how to do this. They can find another community that already did this and see maybe and learn how they've, did the, how they've done this and uh, maybe what obstacles they overcame that the community is facing themselves. Uh, we're also going to make a toolbox of existing resources and materials, and we're also going to be developing new resources when we see that there might be some gaps maybe in knowledge, new things that come up so that we uh, make sure that we try and fill these gaps as best we can. And uh, the policy analysis I mentioned earlier on is also going to be there as a database of best practices for governments and decision makers that want to develop enabling frameworks for energy communities. And now so that I can move on and uh, pass the floor to the panel. Um, the website is not quite ready yet, but we'll have it soon. Um, and there you will then be able to find all the project outcomes, all the resources that we, uh, that we develop and that we found. Uh, there'll be a help desk. We'll also have a newsletter. So if you haven't already indicated that you're interested in receiving it, please uh, do so. And we will be happy to add you to the mailing list as soon as we start the first new newsletter, which will be soon. Um, social media I'm mentioning here, you saw this earlier, there is a hashtag for energy communities. We won't have a social media account as such, but this is the, the place where we will uh, share all the repository work. So that was me. Oh no, almost. Um, <laughs> the consortium, uh, as Achille mentioned, there is uh, Energy Cities indeed, Federen and Rescue EU. Uh, also uh, Akarion, who are doing the work on the website and supporting uh, and, and leading on the database and impact assessment. And also the U U European University Institute, it's always a bit of a tongue breaker, and Florence School of Regulation who are uh, working with us on the, on the policy analysis and doing great work there. Um, yeah, so just to sum up the, the important next things, the call for technical assistance applications will be published in June this year, so keep an eye out for that. The website will be li uh, live sometime this summer as well, and then later this year we'll have the database, policy analysis, uh, some of the best practices, and toolbox later this year. This is me. Now we move over to the panel, and really happy to hear from people from the ground to really share with us what they've been doing and, and uh, how they see the repository ties in with their work, so I'll hand back to Anna. Thanks very much. That's great to hear a bit more detail about what the program entails and how it came about. Um, so we now have um, a short section uh, with panelists, uh, two people joining us online and two people uh, uh, in real <laughs> reality, in real life. <laughs> um, and then there'll be plenty of time for question and answer at the end, and then we'll have some, uh, yeah, some cocktails. Community energy and cocktails. What more could we want from an evening? <laughs> it's really yeah, great to be here. Um, so, the first person that's speaking tonight is Ruth Bajee. 
panel, would you like to come to the stage? Just, we've heard this very, very well. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it all went very well in the dress rehearsal earlier. <laughs> um, but I think our first speaker is Ruth, Ruth Budgie from the Sustainable Energy Authority Island, who's going to be talking a little bit about their work and how they're going to link in uh, with the repository. And hopefully the technology will bring her up onto the screen and we'll all be able to hear and see her presentation. Can you hear me anyway? Oh yes, we can hear you. Oh, <laughs> we can't see start. you, but we can hear you, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Do you want me to wait there, until... There you are, brilliant. We can see you, okay. thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you very much to Miriam and your, and your colleagues for the invitation to participate in tonight's event. It's lovely to see so many of you and it looks like a, a lovely room and uh, certainly the talk of cocktails is making me very jealous that I'm here in Ireland. So I'd just like to wish you all a, a wonderful event. Um, I'm just going to do a little about where our programme began, where we are now and what the future might look like. Um, our Irish experience started as an EU research project with one lead community in Ireland matched with an Austrian and Swiss partner. Ireland then appointed three follow-on communities that were municipal authorities, um, and that project ran between 2007 and 2012. From 2013 onwards, we opened up to a new approach and we provided grant support to engage communities of all types and all scales. Then in 2015, we reissued, I suppose, the, the development of the programme and developed that the network that we have today. So our current network has 650 communities, which even still when I see the numbers just it overwhelms that me in terms of the level of interest we have and despite COVID and the limited contact available and we weren't able to hold events and the supports weren't as strong as they would have been um, we saw the strongest growth in the community network during those two years of our 650 communities and they are all mapped online so we're happy to share that with yourselves a third have progressed developing local energy master plans that's really a way of looking at what the energy opportunities and challenges are and what options are available about 10 percent have progressed on to deliver a community project and uh, we have a community energy grant of 30 million euro annually a further 15 percent have expressed a strong interest in developing grid scale renewable electricity projects so in terms of the ambition and the, I suppose, the, the genuine interest in delivering a greater service to the community, it's really there within our network. Um, we're looking to, to pilot a shared community energy officer with our municipal authorities to try and bring that resource in and to, I suppose, close some of the gaps that exist. Uh, we also have a proposed national stakeholder committee and community forum structure to try and support the policy side and the future development of the programme. We provide mentors to communities um, within each local region. Um, that contract costs us about 2 million euro a year and we're halfway through a four year contract. So it really is about providing those supports locally, making the local connections, understanding the local challenges and providing that peer network for communities. Then in terms of what the future could look like, um, we have a new trust advisor panel in place for renewable electricity projects this month. We have a toolkit of supports there with four key guides already available. Again, totally free and totally shareable. Community solar, community wind, a guide to planning processes and a guide to grid connections for communities. And there's three new ones that will be ready quite shortly around business planning and procurement for community energy projects, stakeholder engagement and community benefit funds, and then community groups and governance. And they're just guides that we're working with various practitioners in the market to support communities in those areas. Also launching this month is a grant for early, mid and late stage development costs for these renewable electricity projects. Grants are available for feasibility studies, project design, planning, grid connection, submission costs and advice for project financing. So it's really about having a combination of grant support and trusted advisors available to these community projects. From the work we've done uh, and the studies we did and the consultation, particularly with Scotland, was that the, there's a very high failure rate at these early stages in the projects. So we're trying to de-risk that early stage. So it's it represents about 80% of those early project development costs. Um, projects in Ireland that want to sell into the grid have to do a community benefit fund. Um, and SEAI is responsible for managing that register of all those projects. So over the next um, 20 years, it should represent a transfer to communities of about a billion euro in community benefit funds. So that will help realize an awful lot of the ambitions that we see. Um, 
each local authority is also now working on their own decarbonisation zone um, to, den to identify and demonstrate future solutions. So it's great to have both the informal community and the formal structures of government working together on this. Then in terms of recognising the challenges and I suppose echoing some of the earlier comments made, the real key challenge now is energy affordability and security of supply. So it's a, it's a change in focus for communities and we really need to work to see how we can protect the most vulnerable um, and also work to support renewable self-consumption projects for low income and vulnerable households as the Renewable Electricity Directive requires of us, but also in terms of a, a fair um, transition. We are looking at a new scheme at the moment for looking to support people that have a health dependency on electrical equipment and see if we can get them a, a fast track to a PV system just to take away some of the cost impacts um, that have happened over the last couple of months and to protect them from future rises. Also need to the challenge of continuing to develop energy skills and literacy ensuring the just transition and then marrying the scale of climate ambition and the scale of development necessary to meet those challenges. I'm really looking forward to seeing other projects and other community models, and in particular, how you will assess the impacts, especially how we go beyond energy impacts, so the social, the wider environmental, the justice, the inclusion, energy poverty, supply chain, behavior change, circular economy, and that was just a quick list up all together. So there's, there's a lot of work there, but it'll be great to be able to correlate projects across Europe so we certainly believe in a societal-led transition to a low-carbon society that will be supported by technology, but society needs to lead that, and we want to be there to help. So thanks very much, and I look forward to the discussion later on. Oh, that's amazing, Ruth. Thank you so much. That's so incredible. We've already got 700, 650 communities, and sounds like lots of things, lots of ideas to share and resources that we can work together on. That's really fantastic. Thank you. Um, I forgot to say earlier that if you're joining us online, you, you're welcome to put any questions in the, in the chat, and we'll be going through those questions um, after this. Okay, so next up uh, on our panel, I think we... Is it... Is it Dirk next? I haven't got the list in front of me. Um, I'll hand over to you. So, uh, good evening. <laughs> so, uh, I'm uh, one of the founding members of uh, an energy community, we could call it. Uh, we call it an energy cooperative. That's only the legal entity. And uh, its name is EcoPower. And uh, last year, in uh, October, we, uh, we held our 30th anniversary festivities. Uh, we did it in five different places in Flanders because we are only active in Flanders, Belgium, in the Flemish uh, region. Uh, but actually, uh, my history um, in this uh, in this field started earlier with a not-for-profit organization. That's also a uh, we see it uh, quite often that uh, that the initiative starts as a as an as a not-for-profit uh, organization, and then continues choosing some legal entity like a cooperative. Uh, so it started already uh, 10 years before in 1982. And uh, this afternoon I, I made a trip down in memory lane. I, I, uh, I was the guide to, uh, to, uh, to my past. And I told uh, people how we started with the renovation of an old industrial mill. Uh, and uh, this, the, the journey started in 1982. And when I look back at, the, at all those, uh, at that time and at all the projects we've gone through, first as, the, as a, as a not-for-profit organization, later as the cooperative, it was a journey of overcoming obstacles. Uh, sometimes it was very big obstacles. Uh, it took us years to overcome it. It took us, uh, it took us to set up a, a lobby group of uh, professors of university and, and uh, lobbying for renewable energy for a legal, a legal framework, an economical framework, so that it was feasible to install uh, to install solar panels and wind turbines in, in Flanders and Belgium, and um, and it, we also got opportunities. Uh, a city, the city of Eclo, who uh, who did a, a tender and was looking for a partner to install some wind turbines on their on their property, on their own uh, own land, public land, and uh, and they were looking for a partner who who uh, was uh, allowing their citizens to to uh, to uh, co-invest. Uh, and the question was, uh, to what percentage can our citizens and our SMEs 
participate in your project. And we answered 100% and we won the tender uh, against all odds, against the monopolists, against all the others. So uh, it's actually a, a constant, uh, when I look back, it's, it's where we have a very good uh, collaboration between the citizens and its municipality that we, uh, that we uh, go fast forward and, and the collaboration between, uh, between uh, uh, energy cities and, and, and the rest of PU is, is also a, a result of this. Uh, so often their best practices are ours, uh, so we, we share them. So um, what is the, the advantage now of the repository is that um, I hope that in a few years we can say that uh, it prevented all these citizens in those countries, in the East, in the Balkans, in, 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 in Portugal, uh, where energy communities are not present yet, uh, that they don't have to overcome all these hurdles I've been uh, facing over the past 35 years. So uh, we should move faster. Uh, we are very grateful and we also worked very hard with, with, uh, with all the organizations in favor of community energy uh, to, to have these definitions we've got now from, from the European Commission. Uh, all member states are now obliged. They have to uh, look for these obstacles they have to take these obstacles away. They have to make an enabling framework. I think in many countries, it's not clear yet that they have to do it and what this enabling framework might be. Uh, we have already good examples like Ireland uh, seems to be a good example. My best example used to be Scotland, but yeah, they're out of the EU now. So, but it can still be an example, I think. So, um, I think it's it's a necessary tool. I, I hope it will be the necessary tool to speed up because that's what what's what's needed, and um, and that we uh, that we avoid all this struggle to overcome uh, the obstacles uh, we have encountered uh, over the past decades. I leave it here. I'm thirsty actually. So unfortunately, Eckhart is still in the train, so I, I will just uh, step in. But the idea of this uh, session was really to just only speak about people that have some experience in, in, in the energy community. So I could do that, actually, because we are trying to do it in, in, in my neighborhood. And what I have seen is how difficult it is to do it if there is no real uh, um, facilitation that is provided by an association in some way or another because I'm living not far from there, actually, and it's a quite poor neighborhood. And the only one that are basically able to understand and maybe invest into something that would be for the energy community in the neighborhood would be uh, the mosque, mosque, we say that? Mosquito, Mos mosque, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they are very keen, actually. They want to do it and they will do it because they really feel that it's something that they can give into their own community and that will help also to explain to uh, people that come to uh, to the pray every week, every week and on Friday, to what is the project about, how to uh, invest. So I think there is things to be done, but always you need to have a kind of an intermediary. It's extremely difficult to do it only with the individual's wills, and uh, that's why we also really are extremely grateful for the European Commission to have started the repository. Uh, I know that there is only like it's like a test phase uh, and we um, but I'm very sure already that we will pass the crash test because I really know we we are we as energy cities we see the demands we see the demands of cities they really need this I mean I have no absolutely no doubt about the fact that indeed there is a need for it how we will deliver it it's difficult that I already know also but uh, my, uh, I'm grateful because we cannot only, in energy cities, we also only attract cities that are extremely committed. And we don't manage to uh, have the, the capacity to really outreach to every city in, in EU. However, those cities and those citizens group 
even if they don't know about the cooperative or they don't know about a model, they know about the European Commission. So for me, the fact that it is basically this repository is as the institutional backup, I see really the absolutely great complementarity with all the work we have done, all the work we will continue to do, but it's very necessary that it is embedded into an institutional framework. Then the way we will divide the role in the future between the different actors, uh, between the energy communities experts, between the cities experts, between the EU policy experts, we will see in the, f in the future. But we have seen with the Covenant of Mayors, for example, that this institutional backup is the absolute key to the real outreach and the multiplication. Uh, so often we are asked about how do we massify? Well, we massify if it's on the very top of the agenda of the European Commission. So that's, I know it, it is, and I, I'm really, I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Oh, th thanks so much, Claire and Dirk. That was really, really interesting. And it's, yeah, I totally agree with everything that you say around enabling these, these projects to happen. And also, you know, we're in a climate crisis. You know, we need to all be acting together and not reinventing the wheel. We need to be sharing best practice and just copying. I know when I said that the energy community in the UK, you know, we had a model from another one and that we, that we worked with and, and adapted because, yeah, it, it's much more, much more efficient and better for everybody's time and energy. So no, that's, that's great. Thank you very much for those insights. Uh, the last person we have on the panel is Susanna Sasiak uh, from the Polish Green Network, and hopefully she will also appear <laughs> by magic on the screen. Um, great. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me start with a short personal remark. Uh, I would like to say that as a person who has been striving to introduce the idea of renewable energy community in Poland for the last two years or even more, I am extremely happy to, uh, to, to be here and, and to witness the, the launch of the repository project. Uh, anyway, uh, talking about the situation of renewable energy communities in, in Poland, uh, we have to be aware that this is a, a part of a larger task of energy transition that our country has to face. Uh, actually, uh, well, the main problem that we are facing here is uh, our government's resistance to the systemic change of energy market, um, resistance towards the change from the central uh, centralized energy based on uh, fossil fuels uh, to, uh, to the model where, where energy is dispersed and, and produced by consumers and based on renewable uh, resources only. Uh, and uh, another thing, um, another thing that we have to overcome in Poland is a kind of a resentment against uh, collective actions and particularly uh, against cooperatives, uh, because the formula of cooperative has been uh, has been really um, functioning in a distorted way uh, during the socialist uh, era in Poland. Uh, and all these aspects are uh, seem to be quite common for all Central European uh, countries, actually. Uh, as far as I know, this um, this resistance of, of politicians, of governments, uh, can be witnessed also in uh, in Czech Republic, Hungary, or uh, or Romania. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there has been a breakthrough uh, regarding this systemic change into into energy democracy. Uh, a few years ago, our government has uh, introduced um, liberated rules uh, for individual consumers. Uh, just now, in April, they have uh, introduced the very first rules on collective consumers. Uh, so we are deeply convinced that the time for renewable energy communities in Poland is also coming. Um, what we uh, what we do uh, as the Polish Green Network, my organization, is we are facing three parties uh, in in Poland. First of all, the government. Uh, we want the government to introduce um, clear and uh, and fair uh, legal rules um, compatible with the Red Two Directive. Uh, we want them to uh, to set some financial su financial support for the very first initiatives over energy communities. Um, 
Secondly, we, uh, we address um, local governments because we would like them to take on the role of local leaders uh, in this uh, transition into, into social energy. And uh, thirdly, of course, we, we address uh, citizens, citizens uh, organizations uh, trying to raise their awareness uh, and about the, the formula of the idea of, uh, of energy community. Um, and actually, uh, my organization, the Polish Green Network, we have been digging into this topic since 2019. Uh, and we have been doing all our best to introduce all possible tools and materials and knowledge into the into to, to, to present it to our Polish society. That is also how we uh, how we contacted uh, with uh, with the rescope. Uh, so I am I am very I am very happy that the, the repository will will now be our tool. Uh, because we already have some successes regarding the raising awareness of people. Uh, there are already two small uh, cooperatives registered in Poland, and the third bigger one is now in the process of uh, formal registration. Uh, so I think that this level of convincing people to undertake uh, the um, uh, the the idea of energy community is this is this easiest and the fastest part. But uh, when we manage to raise the awareness then these, these people come back to us and they they ask us uh, they want they ask us for more information more details and tools uh, and that is where uh, how how the repository will be useful i think that uh, it will be kind of a give and take uh, cooperation with the re repository because we will suddenly take profits from from its data from its uh, from its possibilities but we will also um, give an input about how the situation uh, of uh, renewable energy communities in Poland is is developing. Yes, so that's that's all from me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And yes, it's definitely in the whole idea around give and take and sharing ideas and best practice is what this repository is, is all about. Um, the other group that maybe we should mention um, as part of this program that will be working in collaboration uh, with the Rural Energy Community Advisory Hub as well, because we're focusing on the urban energy communities and we'll be working in partnership with, this, uh, with our colleagues here um, who are running the uh, the Rural Community Energy Advisory Hub. So just to say that there will be support for all types of communities happening throughout Europe. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> or have we explained everything so clearly there's, <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no questions and we just want to go have a cocktail? Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, hi. I'd like to know how you will be selecting the 150 communities that you will be supporting. Is there some minimum criteria that they have to, to meet? Yes, that's a good question about how we're going to select the communities that we provide support with. Um, at the moment, we're developing the guidelines and the criteria actually in collabor co collaboration with the Rural Energy Community Advisory Hub. Um, and there are certain criteria that we'll be, we'll be looking for. There are the 11 focus countries that we really want to sort of, I mean, basically the, the, the assistance will be available for everybody. There'll be online capacity building, there'll be lots of different types of, of support, but we really want to focus our activities on those areas where there isn't as much community energy happening. So uh, there will be the 11 focus countries that will basically get extra points in, the <laughs> in our um, criteria. Um, and then, as I say, we're developing the guidelines and the application form which people will go through. But and we really want to also make sure that it's tailored to the needs of the community. You know, some people are, are starting right at the beginning, other people are further down the line and need a bit more specific, you know, advice around a technical issue, for example. So we'll be really looking at how we can tailor the advice uh, to meet the needs of the energy community. So I don't know if my colleague Elodie, who's also working on this, has anything extra to add about the technical support. I can't see her. <laughs> but I think, I think that's covered. 
but anyway, it'll all, be, it'll all become clear in June when we launch <laughs> launch the uh, the criteria and the the application form. And we really want to make it as easy as possible because I know myself, you know, as a volunteer and an energy community, you know, you haven't got much time, and you really want to just be focusing your time and effort onto the into the places that matter. So we're really going to streamline it and make it as easy as possible to for the communities to see where they are in the in the sort of stage and yeah, what and how we can meet their needs uh, in the best possible way. Uh, and the process of also gathering the data on energy communities, again, we want to make that a sort of easy and, and streamlined again so that we can really be having lots of information, but again, making it as easy as possible for people to participate because we don't want to put any extra barriers or take up any more extra time from people. Um, are there any online questions that are coming through, Miriam? No. <laughs> no. Anyone else have any any questions before we before we move on? Everyone's just so so keen to <laughs> network and talk and have a drink. I, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> oh, there is a question. Great. Do you have right now a technical staff to support the communities? And if so, how peop how many people are planned? Um, Do you want to answer that? Sure. I'm. I mean. So we have staff within the repository. It's a bit weird now. I can't see the people. Maybe I can't <laughs> <on. laughs> um, We have staff members from the repository that are going to do the technical assistance. It feels like walking through a, <laughs> <laughs> through a stage of some sort. Just walk down the um, aisle. And, uh, yeah, yeah but I mean, as mentioned earlier, I hope people can see online now, they will we'll draw on the national experts for the technical assistance as needed. So the we really have net experts in each country, I think minus one uh, at the moment. Um, in the EU uh, and different organizations per country and so on. So um, depending on whether, uh, I mean, for instance, it might be that we receive 20 applications from Poland and one application from Spain, uh, then we will try and find the experts and, and work with them according to the needs. So this is why we wanted to keep it flexible overall. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I would have to run back to that. <laughs> 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 yes, I think that's good. Yeah. And we were hearing on the Leuven study trip, there was someone from a, a municipality in Bulgaria and they were saying, well, we don't know how to start, you know, what do we do? And there aren't any co-ops here, how can we do it? Well, you know, the idea with this repository is we will be sharing all this best practice and working with neighboring countries to look at what is possible within the limits of, of the legislation and the regulation that's in that, in that country. Great, are there any other final thoughts or comments or questions? If not, I'm really looking forward to meeting again at the end of next year to be celebrating, drinking even more cocktails, <laughs> uh, celebrating all of the excellent uh, projects that we've been doing, you know, 150 new projects at least. So, and we've all got a part to play. So I'm really, yeah, looking forward to working with you all on this project. So thanks very much. <laughs>